So I was here last year, and at the time we came for the conference, we hadn't moved to Kubernetes. We were kind of on a mission to ask the people who, who run their, class, their, <coughs> their apps on Kubernetes how their experience was. Um, and since we were on AWS, we were really looking for people who were on AWS. There weren't many people on AWS. Actually, there was just one, the, the guys from OLX. And we used the, the opportunity of the open spaces to kind of ask the hard questions. Um, but I think the problem with Kubernetes, there's a lot of hype around it. And so anyone, anyone you talk to just tells you what's good about it and never really tells you the problems that they went through. And I guess this year it's me trying to pay it forward by telling you all the things that went, that went wrong. Um, and the things that I'm about to list are not really things we experienced because we kind of foresaw them. Um, my slide is really from the context of some, if I was new, what I'd like to be told. And so I kind of narrowed it down to five things. Just to give you some background um, of our journey, we, our stack is on Chef. Um, it's, it's really taken the company through many years, and it's reached a point where it's, it's starting to, to, to fall apart. Because we have multiple apps in the same stack. They have sort of the same dependencies, but some, some clients are older, so they rely on different um, different versions of those dependencies. And so, like, prior to 2016, we started looking at um, redesigning our infrastructure. And so, at, the, at that time, I don't think Docker had hit version one or Kubernetes, and um, we were very hesitant to kind of get into Docker at the same time with Kubernetes. So we opted for ECS, which kind of is simpler than Kubernetes. And we use that opportunity up to, from early 16 to 2017 to kind of learn how to dockerize apps, but we were running on ECS. Our expectation, what, from, what the, from the things that we heard about Docker, we, we were trying to create something that's durable, highly available, easy to diagnose, repeatable, standardized, and secure. Um, experience has taught us that Docker is not really the place to get these things. <laughs> but yeah, but um, I think it's, it's inevitable to use Docker. And we didn't get into Docker because of the hype. We, we really had problems with our old stack. Our apps are very big because we kind of crunch a lot of data. So we use anacondas and, and complex libraries that kind of our bit, to, to give you perspective, our base images for our apps are kind of like 5 GB in size. But we've, we've been able to, em, to employ tricks that give developers up just five minutes deploy time, despite having big images. And so, I mean, that's really what we expected at the end. But the reality is we've had to fight with um kills, bad kernels, increased costs, complexity, We've kind of redesigned our apps because Kubernetes and Docker kind of play by different rules. Um, we used to use Circle CI, and Circle CI just fell apart. We tried to use Travis. Well, it's the same thing. Um, and all our tools for the old stack kind of were useless because Docker is different. And so I think, I think the biggest problem is resource planning is hard. So when, when, it, when people talk about Kubernetes, they always say that, oh, you can set request limits, you can set request sizes, and that helps Kubernetes schedule your application. But the reality is that um, how it works, especially for us, really put us in a bind, because our application has these really big spikes in when it calculates some big data sets. And so that's like an example of something we experience. Typically, our process sits at 430 MB. It could go up to like 800 MB. But there are some jobs which are like, which would cause a spike of up to 24 GB. And this is, 
this is one of the nice ones. We can, <laughs> yeah, because we run on 60 GB boxes and there are processes that spike up to like 55 GB. And so if you, if you, if, if you just come into Kubernetes, you expect like the magical settings that, you know, just tweak your YAML, say that your app is, you know, it uses 800 MB. But the problem with that is it, it kind of conflates the, the problem of resource planning because the spikes are really large. So do you set, do you tell Kubernetes that your app uses 800 MB or do you tell your app that, um, do you tell Kubernetes that your app uses 25 GB? If you choose 25 GB, then most of the time you waste a lot of resources. And if you choose 800 MB, then your, then your container gets killed. And so when, whenever we started running our apps, we, we really had to understand how Kubernetes um, handles processes. And I think I, ca I can just summarize it in three. Um, if, if your node is resource starved, Kubernetes will give it a soft or hard eviction. If your if your container exceeds the limits that you've set by Kubernetes, it gives it a container um. And if the resources on the node hit the node limit, it hits a container um. But this, 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 are not, this is not the only problem you kind of have to deal with because of how much our apps use and how we've set requests and limits. We tend to over commit our nodes. And the problem with over committing your nodes is when Kubernetes schedules stuff, it, it, lumps, it lumps that up into what it, what it calls allocatable resources, right? But there are components of Kubernetes that don't run in containers. So you have stuff like Kubelet and Docker itself. So even as you schedule resources, you're not, it's, Kubernetes is not really keeping the non-pod components in consideration, you see. So if Docker on your node falls apart, I think you have big problems. Kubernetes provides flags that you can pass to Kubelet, Kubelet to help you set what they call system reserved um, resources and cube reserves. So you can tell Kubernetes that don't use this. I, Whatever's available on the node minus these resources is what is allocatable, and it factors that in. The second problem is, I think this seems very obvious, but as much as if, if, you, if you listen to people talk about Kubernetes, you think that it's this thing that you'll install and it will solve all your problems. Um, and I think when we installed it, we realized that it's, it's pretty much rewritten the rules of everything we had. And that means we had to write lots of glue to make things work. At, a, at, at its core, Kubernetes is just an API over the hard problems of DevOps, but it's no way a CI, it's a CI tool. So you kind of have to, if you're coming into Kubernetes, you really have to think about your continuous delivery pipeline. Um, and at this point, continuous delivery is a solved problem. There are tools out there. You just have to write the glue to kind of put things together. Um, and keep in mind that Kubernetes, your, your, your internal workflow is not part of one of, it's not one of Kubernetes features. So each company has a way of working, and for us, we had to write a tool called Pod Control that kind of uh, handles the business logic. So we rely on the on Kubernetes APIs. We rely on other tools like Jenkins to kind of put it together. And Pod Control is this web dashboard coupled with a CI with a CLI tool that kind of gives our developers a Heroku-like experience. So. So the DevOps team takes the complexity and simplifies everything for the devs. So they kind of just, if you want to deploy, you just write port control, deploy, blah, blah, blah. And the port control binary, we kind of 
since the kubectl source code is available, it's something you can just in, in, import into your Go project and kind of extend the features that are in kubectl. So internally, we don't use kubectl. We have our own wrapper around kubectl. And it talks to port control. And port control talks to Jenkins and abstracts everything for the developer. So developers tend not to know much about Kubernetes or even Jenkins. The dashboard pulls logs, builds, and everything onto one dashboard. So we found it very, it, it's taken a lot of work to build port control, but the benefit is we have one dashboard that does everything for, for the devs. So the second thing, uh, the third thing is monitoring and logging is very important. We got this right because the first, the first two apps that we deployed to our Kubernetes stack was a metrics stack and, an, and a logging stack. We use Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Filebit for our logging. We use um, Telegraph, InfluxDB, and Grafana for our metrics. And this has really come in handy because Kubernetes is very complex. And the fact that you're using an orchestrator means that you have more things to watch. So in our old infrastructure, we just had the apps and the hosts. In the orchestrated containerized infrastructure, we had Kubernetes to watch. And Kubernetes itself is made up of so many components. <laughs> you know, and you kind of, when something goes wrong, you don't know which of those components has gone wrong. Um, and as much as I sound like a doomsday <laughs> say about uh, Kubernetes, I remember one time all our masters had, masters had an issue and they were offline, but the cluster still ran. I'm in no way saying that Kubernetes is not, is not dur it's not, um, I don't know what the word. Um, it can survive the, the weirdest bugs, so. And this is actually a mistake that we made, which is why I put it here. We, we didn't prioritize cluster security. We looked into cluster security later on. And the problem of, of doing this later on is that it's very diff difficult to rewire everything if you haven't put security in consideration from the word go. When we got into Kubernetes, we were in version 1.5, which didn't have which um, the RBAC support was a bit iffy, so we didn't opt to use it. And now we are trying to set up our RBAC, RBAC, RBAC policies correctly, but the problem is you've deployed all your apps without the policies, so it's kind of tricky to kind of apply security retrogressively. And if you're moving into Kubernetes, I advise you to, if security is important, just evaluate the feasibility of what you do in your old stack in Kubernetes. For example, for us, we use SSH for the old stack, and we go through Duo, which allows people to get in using TF. Um, it verifies them using 2FA. The problem with kubectl is that all those security benefits that we had in the old stack fell apart in kubectl. Because kubectl is open, and even and even at the point that we set up Kubernetes, as I said, we hadn't prioritized security. It means that even when we were taking it to the developers, everyone would have shared the same config, which means everyone was an admin on Kubernetes. Lucky for us, we, we had security by obscurity. <laughs> since, we, since we wrote our wrapper, our wrapper, the devs had no idea that they had much power. <laughs> and it gave us time to fix that later on. Yeah. Um, but once in a while, there was a dev who would come and say, oh, I ran kubectl get pods, and I got all the pods. And I'm like, <sighs> yeah. um, The last main thing I'd urge you to, to kind of keep top of mind is and determinism will bite you. In our old stack, we kind of had a sense of where our app runs. The app was written making assumptions about how many types of nodes there are, what types those nodes are, 
we had an idea about how long it takes to deploy and where the app would land. So our old stack was predictable but inflexible, which was why we were trying to move away. But in Kubernetes, I think I'd say the most predictable part of Kubernetes is that you're using Docker, so you package your app in Docker and that's, that's more or less, the, what you've built is what you'll ship, but beyond shipping, everything is, everything is kind of unpredictable. You don't know where it lands. And for us, this was a big deal. It might not be a big deal for you, but our apps were written with assumptions of where they'd land. We rely on nodes having a certain volume, nodes having a certain folder, and stuff like that. And so, and some of our worker processes need to run like, they assume that they'll, they'll, they'll run on different hosts, but whenever we deployed to Kubernetes, Kubernetes would schedule like three of our workers on the same box, and the code wasn't written to, with that case in mind. So, whereas we got the flexibility out of Kubernetes, the, the trade-off was unpredictability, and I think should factor that in. Yeah, so that's, I hope that will help you if you're considering Kubernetes. <laughs>